Hi everyone, this is Dr. A, and I've got a review video on glucose regulation and basically diabetes. Okay, so let's just start with carbohydrate metabolism. So most ingested carbs are polymers, um, usually starches. Uh, they can be, we don't usually ingest glycogen, but it, glycogen is a polymer too. So um, starches would be like breads, pasta, rice, all those kinds of things. And polymers meaning simply that um, there are multiple single sugars linked together. Uh, these, when you ingest them, are broken down by enzymes, amylase, uh, in your digestive tract, especially your uh, small intestine, and they are converted to disaccharides. So amylase breaks them down into disaccharides, which are um, two sugar molecules. And uh, an example would be sucrose. And then uh, those disaccharides are then converted to monosaccharides by enzymes. So for sucrose, uh, the enzyme would be sucrase, and it would break it down into the two monosaccharides, fructose and glucose. The monosaccharides are then what is absorbed by the gut and transported to the liver. Glucose is the only monosaccharide there that can be directly used for energy or stored as glycogen. Uh, galactose and fructose have to be converted to glucose and the liver does that so uh, their stopping point is the liver and if there's too much of that you can also get a fatty liver but uh, anyway it has to be converted your muscles cannot use fructose your muscles cannot use galactose they have to use glucose so uh, once glucose is sent throughout the body it needs to enter the cell and insulin is going to help it enter, enter the cell. Uh, and once it enters the cell, it has, uh, there's three different metabolic pathways it can go down. But we're not going to go into that into details. But just the ultimate goal of that is to convert glucose to ATP, which is the energy molecule, and then carbon dioxide and water, which are the waste. All right, the liver, the pancreas, and other endocrine glands do control blood glucose concentrations, and they try to keep it within a narrow range. The hormones that can control glucose levels are, the two most important ones you really need to know are insulin and glucagon. <clears throat> so insulin is produced from the pancreas and its goal is to lower blood glucose levels. So insulin often kicks in after you've eaten a meal, especially if there's a lot of carbohydrates in the meal. And um, the glucose is absorbed, it spikes in the blood, and so insulin will lower that blood glucose. It will favor the production of uh, glycogen, and it will try to shunt as much of the glucose into the cells as possible by binding to uh, receptors on the cells to allow the glucose to enter. Uh, glucagon is also produced from the pancreas, and it's produced to raise blood glucose. So glucagon would be more likely to be produced, for example, if you're fasting or if you haven't eaten in a long time or maybe you skip breakfast or something like that. So uh, what it's going to go do is it's going to go find your glycogen storage in your liver and it's going to use it to start releasing glucose to maintain your blood glucose. All right, epinephrine and glucocorticoids. So those are stress hormones. Uh, gluc glucocorticoids would be like cortisol. Uh, they are both uh, released from the adrenal glands and they will increase glucose. So they will increase glucose so that you can make more ATP so that you can fight whatever threat your body thinks you're facing. The growth hormone and adenocorticotropic hormone both come from the anterior pituitary and now ACTH or adenocorticotropic hormone is obviously rela related to glucocorticoids. Uh, it's what stimulates the release of glucocorticoids such as cortisol, well cortisol especially. And uh, they will also raise glucose so uh, because to grow you need energy and um, again ACTH is related to stress. To fight stress you need energy so you need an increased glucose. Thyroxine uh, produced by the thyroid gland and somatostatin produced by the pancreas will also both increase glucose. And thyroxine is because um, it's thyroid hormone that you know would increase your metabolic rate. So higher, the more thyroxine, the higher the metabolic rate, the higher the metabolic rate, the higher the glucose. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about hyperglycemia. Uh, it is an increase in plasma glucose levels and it's usually caused by an imbalance of hormones. Diabetes mellitus is a group of metabolic diseases that are characterized by hyperglycemia and it usually either results from defects in insulin secretion, defects in insulin action, or maybe both. So we're going to go into and explore diabetes mellitus. We have 
type 1 diabetes mellitus and uh, this uh, diabetes results from the cell mediated, mediated autoimmune destruction of the beta cells of the pancreas and this causes an absolute deficiency of insulin so your immune system attacks and destroys all the cells that can produce insulin and they're all gone and you the, the patient makes no insulin at all uh, these are only about 10 to 20 percent of all diabetes case and they usually occur in childhood and adolescence um, and there is a genetic component because there's a genetic component to a lot of the autoimmune diseases um, and it's also um, I mean it can be linked to other autoimmune diseases so if you have one autoimmune disease you're usually likely to get another one uh, it is possible to get type 1 diabetes as an adult also it's just it tends to show up in childhood and adolescence uh, you see uh, absence of insulin with an excess of glucagon and why would we have an excess of glucagon if we have um, hyperglycemia because there is plenty of, of sugar in the bloodstream why raise more well the the thing is is what signals the release of glucagon is what's going on inside of the cells so if the cells are starving for glucose and your glucose level within the cells is low that will trigger the release of glucagon because basically the cell is assuming that there is no glucose in the bloodstream the thing is is there's no insulin to get the glucose in so that could actually uh, cause their blood sugars to get really high because not only do you not have the insulin to get it into the cells but then you also have the glucagon that's causing you the patient to release like all their stored glucose and uh, they also have a greater tendency to produce ketones so the cells not getting the glucose are going to in order to survive they're going to have to burn an alternate fuel that alternate fuel is fats and uh, in the form of ketones the ketones is a, a way to an alternate way to get energy and so you will see the uh, byproducts of that uh, in the bloodstream and so type 1 diabetes is often associated with increased levels of ketones now type 2 diabetes is usually characterized by hyperglycemia but it's caused by resistance to insulin so it results um, in a relative insulin deficiency so this is what it means it actually there is enough insulin produced and sometimes there's even an overproduction of insulin it's just the receptors on the cells are damaged in some way or they're just not responding to the insulin and therefore they're not allowing um, the glucose to come in adequately it does cons constitute a majority of the cases of diabetes and it's usually adult onset although we're seeing more and more in uh, children and adolescents <clears throat> and the it is very much lifestyle mediated so if you eat a lot of uh, junk food sodas you know standard American diet you're likely uh, to get diabetes the risk factors include age obesity lack of exercise and genetic predisposition so it does run in families the presence of insulin and hyperinsulinemia uh, is usually noted so again they usually they have insulin it's not type 1 there's no insulin type 2 there is insulin and sometimes too much insulin uh, and then the glucagon um, is not going to be present as much as in type 1 because some of the insulin is docking on the receptors and allowing some glucose in so some of the glucose is getting into the cell some of it is being left behind and so there's enough to suppress a great glucagon release and there's also enough to suppress ketogenesis and so there's usually in type 2 diabetes you don't see ketones but they have a greater tendency to develop what we call hyperosmolar non ketotic states which means are it's kind of like a, a really bad dehydration with really concentrated blood but no ketones and then uh, you have gestational diabetes which is really close to type 2 diabetes but <clears throat> it's it happens during pregnancy and um, if a patient has gestational diabetes they are more at risk of developing type 2 diabetes later on in life so um, how do we diagnose the criteria for testing for either prediabetes or diabetes are uh, all adults who are older than 45 years uh, they should at least have a fasting blood glucose measured every three years unless they already know they have diabetes the testing should be earlier or more frequent if you have if a person has disease factors overweight tendencies so the BMI is greater than 25 habitual physical inactivity so they're at a maybe at a desk uh, all day 
sitting all day. They have a family history of diabetes on a first degree relative, so that would be like a, a sibling or a parent. They have, uh, they're on a high risk minority population, such as African American and Latino. They have a history of gestational diabetes or delivering a baby that's greater than nine pounds and have hypertension defined as a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90. So uh, the criteria for type 2 diabetes testing in children, it begins at age 10 or at the onset of pu puberty and um, follow-up testing every two years. If they have a family history, first or second degree of type 2 diabetes, so that would be not only a sibling or a parent, but maybe an aunt, or uncle, or grandparents. Um, their race, ethnicity is either African American, Latino, or Native American. They have signs of insulin resistance. Um, so there's some skin changes and some things you can look at. And they have like abdominal obesity is another one. And they have maternal history of diabetes or gestational diabetes mellitus. So the diagnostic criteria are the same for type 1 and type 2. The fasting glucose is going to be above 126 milligrams per DL. They will have symptoms of polyuria, sort of peeing a lot, polydipsia, they're really thirsty, polyphagia, they're really hungry, and for type 1 they'll have an unexplained weight loss. Um, type 2 are usually they're overweight. And um, they, if there's a random glucose that's greater than 200, so random glucose means taken at any time of the day, not fasting. And if they have an A1C greater or equal to 6.5%, or a two-hour glucose uh, test that is greater than 200. So it's, um, that's when you measure the blood glucose um, two hours after a 75-gram glucose load. And if that is greater than 200, that's uh, diagnostic of diabetes. If for type 1, you can do autoantibody levels. So islet cells, anti-GID 65, and anti-insulin antibodies. For prediabetes, so that's kind of like the gray area where you don't quite have diabetes, but you're not normal either. So your fasting glucose will be abnormal. It'll be greater than 100, but it'll be less than 126. And your two-hour uh, oral glucose tolerance test, if it's greater than 140, but less than 200. So you, you know, to do that same two-hour with that 75-gram load and test the blood, blood sugar two hours later. And then lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about hypoglycemia because it is related um, to diabetes. So it is a plasma glucose level of less than 55 milligrams per DL. It can be transient, so it just kind of comes and goes and relatively insignificant, especially if you can get to food uh, and you know, correct it. But it could be life-threatening if, if it's not corrected. It can be the result of insulin injections or illness. So um, when patients have diabetes, uh, sometimes they don't understand uh, that if, like, if they have to come in fasting for some blood work, that they shouldn't take their medication. And so uh, it's good to be very, uh, you know, specific about that. Or maybe they gave themselves their insulin injection and ate and then got sick or something like that. And illness always messes with their blood sugar. So they could get hypoglycemia. The symptoms of hypoglycemia, the uh, neurogenic ones are tachycardia, palpitations, diaphoresis, tremors, pallor, and anxiety. The uh, symptoms uh, that are glycopenic are headache, dizziness, irritability, fatigue, poor judgment, confusion, visual changes, hunger, seizures, and coma. People that have hypoglycemia tend to act like they're drunk, basically. Um, normally, the brain needs glucose to function. It can be trained to use ketones, but it does take uh, a few weeks, and you, there's still a certain percentage of your brain that has to have some glucose. So uh, it is important, uh, and you will see signs and symptoms if the brain does not get enough glucose. And that is the lesson. Thank you so much for your attention.